it's not so easy anymore to choose the right tractor. The horsepower versus size, a lot of this has become much more confusing with some recent regulations. We're going to try to help you through that today. Let's get started. This episode, along with the next several episodes, are going to comprise a buying guide for compact tractors. We're going to go through a lot of different topics that uh, we get questioned on a lot. Try to explain in some detail, at least enough detail, to help you in your tractor buying decision. In this particular episode, we're going to talk about horsepower. There's many different things you need to consider on a tractor, and one of them is how much horsepower you want. 10, 15 years ago, this was all uh, a part of the same question because the smallest horsepower tractor would be in the smallest frame and the frame sizes would increase with the horsepower. But that's all got jumbled up recently with some EPA regulations. And I say recently, I mean within the last 10 years. So let's go into some of those regulations. These new regulations that I'm talking about are from the EPA. And when I say new, it's uh, 10 years, probably even longer than that, that they've been going on. Most of them, I think, came in during the Obama administration. Uh, it's referred to as the Tier 4 requirements for small diesel engines, or actually any diesel engines. Of relevance to us is that under 25 horsepower engines really haven't changed much. They may have a little bit of restriction on them, but, but no big deal. So that would be your subcompact tractors and anything up to that 25 horsepower limit, really no changes. 25 to 75 horsepower uh, machines have tighter restrictions, right? And then above 75 horsepower has the tightest restrictions that we have. The 25 to 75 horsepower is really the one that's probably most interesting to our viewers. Uh, I'm sure there's more sub-25 sold, but this is, you know, we're talking about the complexities here today, so that's, that's what we're going to address here for a moment, is the 25 to 75. Most of these tractors deal with these regulations through a system we call DPF. It's a diesel particulate filter. The DPF, or diesel particulate filter, that catches all those small particulates, that's a big word for me, so that they don't get into the atmosphere and, and cause whatever damage they might cause there. The complexity in the system is that we have to uh, clean that filter periodically. And that process is called regen. Controlling this regenerating process is where all the cost comes in. First, you have the filter itself, which is expensive. But then you have the sensors, uh, computer system that all work together to monitor the soot level in the filter. And then when it gets to a certain stage, that computer has to tell the engine to heat up, run at higher RPM, get that exhaust temperature up to the desired state so that we can burn out that filter. This process takes sometimes 15, sometimes 30 minutes. So it can be quite inconvenient uh, for the user, especially if you're wanting to turn your tractor off and it starts that regen right before you get done with, with your work. Now, if you're doing work, let's say you're out mowing uh, in your yard or in a field or wherever, the regen happens, you see the little light come on, you don't notice any other change. You only notice that if you're just puttering around the, the property, you're idling, uh, it will raise the engine RPM and it will insist on you not shutting the tractor off for a period of time. Again, maybe up to 30 minutes. So two negatives about the DPF system. One is the cost. It's roughly $3,000 overall to the, to the tractor, uh, add-on uh, compared to uh, the base tractor. It's also inconvenient, right? I don't think there's really much of a reliability issue anymore. There was early on. Uh, we'll get into that maybe more in a minute. There is another alternative. It's usually referred to as DOC. I don't even know what that stands for, and I don't really care. Um, you can always uh, talk to me about it in the description. That's fine. But at a high level, it uses uh, rare earth metals in the filter to collect those particulates and doesn't require the regen cycle. I don't really understand why, but my understanding is, is that the exhaust runs a little bit hotter all the time than it does on a DPF system. 
What I'm saying is, is that a DPF runs, say, at this temperature, and then for regen, it jumps up to this temperature in the exhaust, whereas a dock system would run somewhere in between those, right, and always run at that temperature. Several manufacturers have used this. Mahindra is still using it actively, and they brag on it. They say they had a $30 million investment to be able to get the, their approach finalized and, and working properly. Um, Massey Ferguson here did use it uh, on this series. This is a 1700 series, not the GC 1700, the 1700 mid-level series. Uh, they moved away from it about a year ago, and it's not because, to my knowledge, that they had any issue with that. They changed engine manufacturers from Shibaro to somebody else. I don't, I don't know, I think it's Iseki they went back to. They did that for business reasons. It really had nothing to do with the DPF versus stock debate. But anyway, Massey no longer offers. This one that I'm on is a used tractor. Uh, to my knowledge, Massey no longer offers a dock system on this size. I think they have one model, the 4707, that still has dock and not DPF. The dock is cheaper. It may run a little hotter all the time. That's my understanding. But it doesn't have the regen cycles. Now, my question is, why hasn't everybody gone to this approach? It would seem to make sense to avoid the regen. Um, it's a little bit cheaper overall. So you would think that Deer and Kubota and Coyote and, you know, the, the Daedong, be, Coyote there, and would be all excited about moving away from the DPF. And uh, this has been several years now. I'm really surprised that they haven't done so. I can only assume that they have found something that they think might be less reliable about that solution. That's an assumption on my part. I really don't know why. Maybe it's just the status quo. They know how to do the DPF. They feel like they've got it working and, and they're willing to go forward uh, like that. Don't know. Hey, we want to give a special thanks to Routabush Equipment. Got several nice new tractors here we're able to, to investigate and look at today. Thanks very much. What about reliability? Here are a lot of folks saying, I don't want to buy one of those uh, fancy emission systems, they mean DPF, because I'm worried about it being unreliable. I think we saw some of that early on. Uh, probably the, the most notable, or maybe I should say notorious, would be the Kubota B3350. Uh, it, was, it was not, let's say, not the best uh, implementation for DPF. They had a lot of problems with it. Uh, they admitted it and they resolved that with the LX series. That's the LX3310 that I have. We haven't had any issues uh, with that tractor really at all, uh, especially with the DPF. The engine has all been flawless on that machine. So, so I, I think the, the systems are more reliable than they were. I think they've got the kinks out, got the bugs out. I'm not hesitant at all from a reliability standpoint about purchasing one of these DPF enabled tractors. Um, if you've had any issues with your DPF in the last couple, three years, uh, I'd like to hear it in the comments just to, to see if other people are it's experiencing it. I'm certainly not seeing online very many complaints uh, about regen DPF not working, your system just overall failing. I'm, I'm not seeing that. Whereas we did maybe in 2015, 2016, early on there, see some issues. Now it's time for me to share some of my opinions. Some of you might get triggered by some of my opinions, um, but most of you say you like to hear them. So if you're easily triggered, just, you know, relax a little bit and hear me out. All of these EPA mandates are meant to help the environment either with the particulates sometimes we talk about here or with global warming, etc. They're, they're intended to help the environment. Now, I still personally have a lot of doubts about man-made global warming, but for a moment, let's assume that global warming is caused by uh, man-made exhaust from, from engines, etc., etc. The big picture looks like this. This is a graph of the world's CO2 output over time. Notice the lighter blue line declining slightly over the last 10 years. That's the USA. The gray line just below it is the EU. The dark blue line is China. Notice the sharp rise over time. The dark gray line is India. Again, increasing over time, and now it's matching the EU. Likewise, the yellow line is the rest of the world, steadily increasing. 
The red line at the top is the total CO2 emissions from the entire world. Notice how small of a portion the EU and the USA contribute. If the USA went to zero, it wouldn't make much of a difference. Now back to tractors. How much does the tier four requirements for the under 75 horsepower, uh, between 25 and 75, really help? There's not near as many of these engines on the market as there are the big truck and uh, a lot of big diesel engines on the market. They, you wouldn't think they'd put out near as many noxious emissions. I view this $3,000 upcharge or more in, in these tractors as a tax. And personally, I, I'm not sure it's worth it. I'm, I'm not sure we're getting that much benefit. I know a lot of you are saying we can't do anything about it, so just, you know, don't worry about it. And, and you're right. Uh, so I won't spend too long about it. I, I don't get it, right? Uh, so consider that when you do go to vote. And yeah, that's the end of my rant. I don't want to go too far on this. I just, just want to raise that we've done this to ourselves. Now remember, these are only my opinions, and uh, I, I'm not going to state them too strongly. Please don't decide you're not going to watch because you disagree with me on a, a topic like this. It's, 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 it's not worth dividing over, right? I mean, we, 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 we can only do so much, we, so there, there, there's no use of, of us getting incredibly passionate over these topics. Let's summarize what we've talked about today. Choosing a horsepower on your tractor is not as easy as it was 10 to 15 years ago. There's a cutoff right there at that 25 horsepower line. You have to make a decision whether you're willing to spend the extra $3,000 or even more on maybe on larger tractors to make that jump or whether you can get by with 25 horsepower. Personally, I think the complexity issue is uh, not a big deal at least in the near term. I have no idea what it's gonna be like at, at 5,000, 10,000 hours on a tractor. It's, it's really hard to, for me at least, to predict that. There may be some folks out there that have five or 10,000 hours on a DPF enabled tractor. I'd like to hear from you as well. But I'm not too worried about the complexity in the near term. I think it's mainly a cost issue. One other reason why this is so complex is because the manufacturers now responding to this understanding of the, the, the price jump are making a lot of machines right here at this 25 horsepower cutoff. Lots of different frame sizes. We're going to go into that in our next episode of this buyer's guide. Try to explain some of the different frame sizes, compromises on that. So I hope you guys will come back for that. Hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you're looking forward to getting yourself a new tractor or a used tractor. We'll talk about that soon too. Thanks for watching everybody. We'll see you next time on Tractor Time with Tim. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean.